Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Nicholas Theodore. I'm a professor of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins, and you are listening to Interview with a Surgeon, brought to you by The Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Nicholas Theodore, Director of the Neurosurgical Spine Program at Johns Hopkins and Co-Director of the Carnegie Center for Surgical Innovation at Johns Hopkins. He's a nationally recognized expert in brain and spinal cord injury, minimally invasive spine surgeries, and robotics. As an award-winning teacher and researcher, Dr. Theodore has written or co-authored 30 book chapters, over 180 peer-reviewed journal articles, and is co-holder of 10 patents for medical devices and procedures. His research focuses on trauma, spinal cord injuries, robotics, and developing an understanding of the genetic and molecular basis of spinal diseases. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Neurological Surgery and a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. He is also a member of the American Academy of Neurological Surgery and the Society of Neurological Surgeons. Dr. Theodore has served as a team neurosurgeon for the Arizona Cardinals and as a consultant to the Arizona Diamondbacks and Arizona Coyotes. In 2017, Dr. Theodore was appointed to the head, neck, and spine committee of the National Football League. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on the interview with the surgeon. Today, we have Dr. Nicholas Theodore. Dr. Theodore, how are you doing today? Doing great, thank you. Thank you for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. Thinking back, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change throughout your fellowship? Yeah, so I think everybody has a, a unique story to tell, but in, in a nutshell, uh, I went to medical school in Georgetown. When I decided to do neurosurgery, I also had a naval obligation, so I knew I had time to serve in the Navy. And at that time, I was trying to figure out, did I want to train in the Navy or train out of the Navy? Decided that I was probably going to get better training outside of the Navy and was given a waiver, then matched for residency outside of the Navy, and then the Navy called and said, uh, nope, you're coming back in. So ended up doing an internship at the Naval Hospital of Bethesda and then spending time with the Marines uh, over in Okinawa, Japan as a general medical officer for a while. Came back and started residency at Bethesda and then ended up finishing residency in Phoenix at the Barron Neurological Institute. So it was a sort of a twisted uh, pathway. And I think that the goal obviously was to become a neurosurgeon. That, that's what I wanted. And, and it was during that time that I realized that my focus would be spine, but I think that the path is always uh, different for each person. And it wasn't a preordained uh, situation that, oh yeah, you're going to train here and do this and do that. You know, the goal was to, to get the best training I could in neurosurgery. And I think I got that in, in Phoenix. Um, but wherever you train, it's, it's irrelevant. And it's what you put into it is what you get out of it. Yeah, I fully agree with you on that. And thinking when you're going into that fellowship, you know, what was your mentality going into the job interview process for the first time? And how did that perspective change in the beginning of your early career? So a little different in my case, because my, I didn't have a job interview when I finished residency because I was going back to the United States Navy to uh, serve the time out in San Diego at the Naval Hospital. So there was no interview per se. I just sort of got that job. Um, but while I was in uh, San Diego, I started to look around and uh, had been offered a job to go back to Phoenix where I trained uh, to do spine surgery there at the Barrow Neurologic Institute. Um, my mentor, Volker Sontag, had offered me a job to come back. You're living in San Diego on the beach in Coronado, and the question is, well, is there, are there better places than Phoenix? So we started looking around in California, and uh, I realized that at the time, you know, because of the way the medical community was, reimbursement was, et cetera, you know, Phoenix was really a burgeoning opportunity. And, um, you know, you make your decision on that first job. Really, there are three factors, right? There's the job, there's money, and then there's the location. What I tell everybody is you can have two of those three things. Very rarely do you get a $5 million a year job in Beverly Hills, um, you know, with an amazing you know, job. I mean, you, like I said, you get about two of those three things. And uh, I think that um, as you're looking at and evaluating those things, all those things come into play. But I think first and foremost, the most important thing by far is the job. Are the case mixes, are the people you work with, the people you want to be working with, do you trust them? And that really is, I think, the most important thing. The money and the location are, 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 are less important. You have to be fulfilled you know, from a job perspective, otherwise it's not going to be fun. You make $2 million a year, but if you hate it every day, it's not worth it. 
Sure. And kind of thinking through the career path that you've taken, you've been a director of multiple programs, a chief of programs. Can you just kind of walk us through that journey for you? Sure. I, you know, I think the journey started in residency where I, I decided I wanted to do spine surgery. I think, you know, the, the reality is that most neurosurgery residents now are specializing or subspecializing, figuring out what it is they really truly enjoy doing, what aspect of neurosurgery they really want to specialize in and get extra knowledge in. And I made that decision pretty early in residency. And I made it when I was in the Navy because the, what I realized was, first of all, we didn't see a lot of aneurysms and, and brain tumors on a daily basis at the Naval Hospital, but we saw a spine coming out of our ears. And I realized, too, that there was a huge disparity in the way spine care was delivered and really chose to focus on that aspect and to, to provide that, that type of care and elevate the art of spine surgery because it used to be oh spine surgery everybody does it it doesn't it's not really that sophisticated well the truth is it is very sophisticated and there are a lot of nuances and certainly it's a lifelong learning process uh, once i made that decision really have sort of the, my view has been try to be the best that you are and then how do you advance the field so in my career whether that's in spinal cord injury where i have a significant interest in robotics, where I have a significant interest. And again, trying to surround myself with people who can help me advance that cause. So it's working with good people and being able to make decisions and start programs that are going to, you know, move the end game forward. So in that, in that case, it was, uh, you know, making spine surgery a lot better for the patient, a lot safer in, you know, developing tools and techniques that help do that. And that's been my focus. And that has transcended into the education field too because part of my responsibility, I feel, for me personally, is to train the next generation of surgeons. So I've been blessed to be able to work with residents and fellows over the past 20 years who have gone on to do amazing things. And uh, it's a, that is part of the joy of my life, which brings me back to the job. So when you're finishing your residency, really one of the first questions you ask what do you want to do? What, what are you interested in? Do you want to go be in private practice? Do you want to go into academics? Do you want to go into academics? What, what's your focus going to be? What's your shtick going to be? What are you going to do? What are you going to be known for? How do you want to help the field? Do you want to train residents? Or, for, if that, that's not for everybody, what's the, what's the best private practice environment? Do you want to do trauma? Do you not want to do trauma? So you have to, again, think about, for each person, that's different. And that figuring out, what that job is going to look like for them is different. And, you know, but being honest with yourself and sort of understanding with your eyes open as you evaluate jobs, what's in, you know, what the end game is going to look like and what the job is look like is important because all too often people will, will look at a dollar sign and say, this is great. And they'll get there and they'll realize. So most, most residents, um, you know, their first job is not their last job. So, you know, a good percentage of people will move after, a certain period of time for whatever reason. And I think that's very important too, is to keep it out there that your first job is not your last job and to keep that as a mindset going through it. Now with your involvement with ANS and other organizations, societies out there, what are some types of things that you offer to fellows or to residents when they come through the program? And also with the fact with COVID going on right now and most of these national conferences really being all virtual, similar like we're doing now on Zoom, how can they go about meeting folks like yourself? You know, usually they would do it at a national conference, but now they can't do that. And so they face that challenge of the uphill battle of being able to continue to network at the level they used to. That's a great question. So I think the first question is, you know, what do we offer the fellows? I mean, the, you know, the fellowship experience really is not necessarily an experience where you're learning everything new. Right? So most of the fellows come with a pretty good skill set, you know, what I, what my job is really to help them elevate their decision making of them through that aspect of it, patient care, managing complications, uh, handling difficult patients, you know, and handling complications. And how do we, how do we, you know, come back after that? How do we take care of the patient, et cetera? The other, the other part of the, the mission is how do you run an efficient practice? So again, they are, they are getting instruction on how do we schedule clinics? How do we schedule appointments? How do we, schedule surgeries to make you maximally effective, you know, and for, with your time, because that, that time is money for sure. Uh, so those are, those are other aspects of it. From officially through the AAAS, I would say I participate in a number of teaching seminars and things all the time. 
there's nothing formal for the double ANS, but all the fellows that come through uh, my fellowship have you know exposure to a wide variety of everything from medical legal implications of surgery to you know research in the lab, whether it's basic science, robotics, engineering, whatever. How do you start a company if you've got an idea? How do you take an idea and get a patent and then take that into into a product? I've had tremendous experience and success with that. All those things are a part of the are the part of the fellowship. So really, it's whatever the fellow is interested in. Then you've got you know ample opportunity over the course of the year to explore those things. So the world has changed for sure. I have every reason to believe we will go back to some sort of normalcy hopefully soon. Um, but but you know I think that we are relying much more on digital technologies. And I think that you know I'm always accessible. I try to be. We get a lot of applications for college. So to your point. You're not going to bump into somebody now anymore in a meeting and say, hey, I'd like to introduce myself. You know, I'd like to be your fellow or this or that, which is the way a lot of things happen. So I think it's, you know, figuring out some sort of entree and whether it's having your program director reach out to somebody that you're interested in doing a fellowship in uh, at first and then, you know, following up or, or just following up yourself, making those introductions via email, calling the surgeon's office, et cetera, uh, and then getting some time scheduling some time with that person, even if it's 10 minutes, to be able to talk about their particular fellowship program or their career and, and how things may intersect or we're getting advice. You have to be a little aggressive nowadays, too, because we don't have the same opportunities that we had, um, you know, pre-COVID. Now, thinking back to when, when you're getting a job, where you are right now, what advice would you have given your younger self had you been going through that process with all the knowledge and experience that you have now? So I think that I certainly don't don't have any regrets in the regard of what I've done. What I would tell, I think, knowing everything I know, it's go, the, the same things apply. Go into every situation with a positive attitude and work hard, take care of your patients and take care of your office staff and, and the people that you work with closely in the OR, et cetera. Nothing bad will happen if you do those things. In other words, if you if you really maintain that mantra, work hard, be diligent, take care of your patients, and then also taking care of your staff and the OR and, and your office staff, you know, you'll be successful. Hopefully that in that in the realm of the rest of the stuff around you, what can what can hurt you? Well, what can hurt you? Toxic partners can hurt you, uh, people who are not don't share the same interests uh, as you do and are and you know, for whatever reason are just not, you know in your camp or you, for whatever reason you don't get along with, personality disorder, patient care disputes, et cetera. Those, are, those can be difficult situations and those are the things when I talk about the job that are important to sort of evaluate. Sometimes you can't figure that out until you get to some place. Everybody looks like they're a nice person until you get into that practice. But those are the things that become most important because those are the people that are gonna take care of your patients when you're at in town, when you've gone away for the weekend. And you want somebody to care for them as, as you would. And I think that's, that's a very valuable lesson to learn as a junior attending, as a fellow, as a, even as a resident, taking care of you know, other cross-covering for other residents, et cetera. But knowing that in, in, and acting in that manner is, I think, critically important to, to success. But I think that, again, just keeping, you know, keeping everything from, with an open mind and working hard are the things that really uh, pay off in spades. And due diligence is one of those things we really focus on with our clients, just making sure they really understand and ask the questions. I think one thing you can do is never ask enough questions. And so by doing so, you learn so much from it. Now, I think it's pretty cool that you've got involvement with the NFL. I was hoping you can kind of share that with us, how that came to be and exactly what your role is in that position. Sure. So, I, you know, I've been, I've, part of my career has been taking care of professional athletes. So, I was a team neurosurgeon for the Arizona Cardinals for a number of years, worked as their independent neurologic consultant, but also a team neurosurgeon. And so I have a, a rich history of taking care of sports-related injuries, concussions, spine injuries, back injuries, et cetera, from you know, Pee Wee Little League all the way up to professional athletes. And I've you know, been, been honored to be able to take care of you know, many, many professional athletes, baseball, football, basketball, et cetera. And um, through that, I was uh, tapped by the NFL to, to first be on the committee, the Head, Neck, and Spine Committee, which is really the committee that has everything to do with 
rules and regulations regarding concussion and spine injuries, et cetera, how do we make the game of football safer? And uh, two years ago, I was appointed chairman of that committee, which is an amazing opportunity. I'm, I'm on the committee with really the, the best and the brightest in the field of neurotrauma and traumatic brain injury. We meet several times a year and virtually more than that, revising the protocol, looking at research that's being done, what technologies might we bring to bear to improve the outcomes uh, of people who've suffered traumatic brain injury? How do we prevent traumatic brain injury? How do we send people back to play after traumatic brain injury? So all these things are it's a moving target. And our recommendations change based on informed data. So it's been a very exciting uh, aspect of, of, of my career in getting to do that. Football is here to stay, despite COVID. And uh, there will be some season this year. We'll see how that all works out. But at the end of the day, uh, it's all about making the game safer. I've been, I've been really blessed to be a part of that. I think follow your passion. So if I, the last story, you know, I had an opportunity to, to start a robotics company that we were able to sell in 2014 to Globus Medical. And, you know, for years I kept saying, oh, yeah, I'm working on robotics. And we said, oh, that's nice. That's great. And we sort of kept it under the wraps because of, you know, intellectual property issues, et cetera. But, you know, we all have good ideas and we all have ideas of how to make things better. And you can do that. Anybody can do that. It's a matter of keeping focus and understanding what your goals are in that, in that regard. And I think lots of great things can happen. So it's anybody can do anything as long as they keep their mind to it. And I think neurosurgery is such a great field because there's so many different aspects of it. And being good at what you do is really something I strive for every day. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.